Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to our Good Friday service. A year ago, we would have processed into the church in silence, wearing black, cross covered, and purple, the sign of passion. But this year, we're relating home to home, house to house. Have you ever wondered why they call Good Friday good? I mean, it's anything but good. It's awful, it's horrific, it's terrifying. It is excruciating. So why do we call it good? We call it good because out of so much badness, so much goodness comes to us. And so I'm going to be leading you through this service this afternoon, through the prayers, through the scripture readings, and through a message that is designed to bring us to the cross of Jesus. And so the Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our first lesson, traditionally, on Good Friday is from the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. So we read in Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 1, these words. But for since the law has been but a shadow of the good things to come, Instead of the true form of those realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will. O oh, Father, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will he have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And this is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Thanks to you, Lord Christ. Now this is the long passage where John, having been an eyewitness, records the events of the crucifixion. John writes in chapter 19, beginning at verse 17, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, 
in Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, that is, it's Saturday, the last day of the week to the Jews. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness, that is John. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things that took place that the scriptures might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Well, I'd like us in our devotional time this afternoon as we walk through the cross, uh, I'd like us to have a sense of a comfort to suspend the anxiety of the present evil age and simply step back 2,000 years in time to the foot of the cross and begin to portray and see and experience and know and have relationship in many ways with what's taking place there. As you know, we've spent our Lenten season walking through the seven last words of Jesus. On the cross, Jesus gave seven last statements of incomparable significance, defining all of his life and all of his teaching. And this afternoon, I'd like to put those all together into one package and make a whole of that. The first three words were spoken in the first three hours on the cross from nine o'clock till 12 o'clock. The last three were, four words were spoken from 12 o'clock to 3 p.m when he died in the darkness. Now, as you'll recall, uh, after an unjust trial and a sleepless night, Jesus was so badly beaten that he could barely survive. 
Then he spent these six hours on the cross, giving these seven great statements or words. The first was a word about forgiveness. Jesus had been stripped and thrown down on a wooden beam. Massive iron spikes were nailed through his wrist. Historians and archaeologists tell us now that it wasn't his hands as, as portrayed on the crosses that we see today, but he was nailed through the wrist that would hold tighter, the bones were tighter, it wouldn't rip out. And then he's lifted up for all to see. The crowd sends up a great cheer. Executions in those days were public events. They didn't take place behind closed doors. They, they were really a, a sign of a warning to people that if you mess around with our government, you get caught doing some wrongdoing, this is what, what will happen to you. So it was designed to prolong death as long as possible so that the executed could experience them the maximum amount of pain before death became a welcome guest. So there is Jesus on the cross. And quietly, he speaks to his father. He has a request to make to his father. He asks his father to forgive them, those that are crucifying him, because they don't understand what they are doing. Now, notice he doesn't say that they were forgiven. We don't necessarily see that in the text here. And he doesn't say that they were forgiven. What we find is Jesus is acting in this intercessory role as high priest, offering prayers for his people on their behalf. He is asking God to have mercy on these people. Even in death, Jesus intervenes and intercedes and prays for his people. He's praying for you and me this very moment. He's praying that through these words of scripture and as we walk through these moments on the cross, he's praying that, that he can be known right now and that we can find words of comfort and inspiration and, and that he can teach us things that we've never seen before or heard before. I invite you to ask the Holy Spirit into your life this moment to be open and available to whatever it is that God has to say to you as he speaks these words, because ultimately these are the words of history for you and for me this moment in our lives. And so the first word is a word ultimately about the seriousness of sin and that that sin these shameful, harmful acts against God himself require forgiveness and the greatness of God's love. And I want you to know this afternoon that in that greatness of God's love, there is no sin too great. There is no sin too small for God's forgiveness. Now, in the second word, we find that he turns his attention to the two common criminals that are being crucified with him. And he says to, to the one criminal, uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 39 reads, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our disease deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. The second word is a story of the last words of two failures. Two men about to die. Two men that have been judged by society. The first man is angry. He's been hurt. He's been hurt by life. He's been rejected. Now he's rejected publicly. And he asks the ultimate question of Jesus. He wants to know if you're really 
the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Deliverer, the Savior of your people. Because if you are the Savior, then why are you dying on a cross like a filthy criminal? And then he goes one step further and he says, and, and, and if you are the Christ, then, then I, I demand that not only you save yourself, but save us as well. He's an angry man. And he doesn't really have a perspective on what's taking place at this moment. But the other common criminals saw things differently. He watches Jesus suffer. He sees him endure the hammer and the spike, the humility, the mocking of the crowds. He sees in all of that the innocence of Jesus. And as he sees the innocence of Jesus, he sees his own sinfulness, his own guilt. So he makes a confession of faith. He says publicly, at the moment of his death, he says, we are getting what we deserve. We deserve this. But this man, he has done nothing wrong. And he defends Jesus in front of all those who mock him. In this first hour on the cross, he recognizes that Jesus is God, the Christ. And all he could do was to repent and ask for forgiveness, ask for grace. There was absolutely nothing this man could do at this moment but confess, repent of his sinfulness and of Jesus and his innocence and throw himself upon his mercy. Remember me. Remember me, remember me, because I know you are going to your kingdom. You are going to the kingdom of God. And when you get there, remember me. May I might not be far from you. He asked for grace. He admits his own wrongdoing. He's the example for you and for me. Christianity is the only world religion in which an admission of failure is a prerequisite of membership. So here we have two men. One got angry, one got saved. One died in failure, the other died forgiven. One heart was hardened, the other was softened and opened and made available to Jesus. But most importantly, one man died alone and the other went to paradise with his Lord. And that's the question that God asks of us is which one, which man are you this very moment? Which one? Choose this day. Which one are you? And so now we're going to turn to the third word of Jesus on the cross. Someone recently said to me how much they uh, miss worshiping together. I think we all feel that and experience that, especially as Easter Sunday is coming up. But in many ways, God can touch us and minister to us wherever we are through the power of his Holy Spirit when we read his word and we study it. And so we've been going through these seven last words if uh, you're interested in them and haven't heard of this before, we've got these seven last words in, on our website. Look under messages. Three of them are on video. The others are audio. And I think they really uh, allowed us on our website to go into much, much greater detail. But I do want to refresh our memory of what's taking place. So we've had these words of forgiveness. And now we have a word about companionship and relationship that comes from the Gospel of John, beginning at chapter 19, where Jesus turns his attention to the women around the cross. And he says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister. This is John 19, verse 25. Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, the three Marys, two of them will be at the tomb. 
in three days. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. The third word gives a beautiful glimpse of the tender intimacy of the cross. Here we see Jesus and his closest earthly relationship, his mother. And we see John, his closest earthly friend, the beloved, the youngest. He's hanging there. And they are standing there, alone, helpless, watching. Mary remembers Jesus as only a mother can remember a child, the little child Jesus. She, she remembers the announcement of Gabriel of the birth of this child. She, she remembers the excitement of talking with Elizabeth. She remembers making that teeth-rattling, bone-jarring journey to Bethlehem for the purpose of taxation under Caesar Augustus. She remembers the labor pains, the contraction setting in, the midwives called. The next thing she knows there, she's holding the Son of God in her arms. She remembers some visitors, shepherds, town folks stood by. She remembers raising him, the infancy, the dirty diapers, the runny noses, and as he turns into adolescence, the skin, knees. Mostly, I think, she remembers the times when she would read scripture to him, her and Joseph, and, and they would talk about what God had done in the Old Testament and of the coming of this Messiah. He's her little boy, and he's dying on the cross, and Simeon when she was went to the temple to be cleansed after giving birth, said that a sword will pierce your heart one day, Mary. And this is it. She's watching her son, losing her son, dying on a cross. <sighs> Alone. But but in these words, God lets us know that He never wants us to be alone. Never. Sometimes when God seems most distant and far away, he sends a loving person to stand at our side, with us, beside us. Though, so there stands Mary, his mother, and John, his beloved. The two people who loved him most, standing side by side. Mary is losing her son, John is losing his master, his Lord. Now they belong to each other. Then they belong to him. Now they belong to each other. They belong to the ages. Mother, John will be your son. John, Mary will be your mother. And if you ever doubt that I love you, remember Mary, John. And Mary, if you ever doubt that I love you, remember John. Provide for each other. Take care of each other. Be a reminder of my love for you. In this word, God is saying that he is never too busy for you and for me. Stop. He is at his best when we are at our smallest. So he gives this word of relationship and companionship to his mother and to his beloved, John. Now events move to the final three hours on the cross. The fourth word is a word of restoration. Mark records in chapter 15, verse 33, these words. At the sixth hour, that is three o'clock, Darkness came over the whole land, or, uh, that is noon, I'm sorry. Darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, that is three o'clock. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark chapter 15, 
verses 33 and 34. Tens of thousands of people throughout history have experienced the pain of the cross, of crucifixion, of public execution. But only one person has ever felt the full pain of the curse of God to be cast from his presence, and that was Jesus. We all know about the excruciating pain of the cross, of the nails in the hands, of the crown on the head, the dimensions of torture, of the dreadful way this is to die. But when, when Jesus experienced the cross, a curse of God was poured out on him. He experienced a pain that had never been experienced in the whole history of the world. He drank of the cup of the anger of God, the cup filled with the sins of the whole world. It's this cup that he says to his father, if at all possible, let this cup be spared from me. Nevertheless, let thy will not mine be done. Well, this is the cup that he's drinking. He's receiving the curse of the Old Testament to be cast away from the presence of God. And when he felt it, he screamed, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, God turns his back on his son. The intimacy of the relationship is broken, and that's what the word passion means. It's a passion that's taking place here. And he was cut off from his God. And when he was, he said, I, I just don't feel forsaken. It's not an emotional, existential feeling. I am forsaken. Father looks down on his son. And he sees the most obscene, gr grotesque person who's ever lived in the history of the world, filled with all the filth of all the sin of every person who's ever lived. And that cry of forsakenness speaks volumes about the horrors of the abandonment of God and the ruthless, the ruthless penalty of sin. All the wrath of God looks upon him and is focused on him that moment and he experiences the utter abandonment of God. Now it's only by his being forsaken that he could pay the full price of our redemption. It is in his rejection that we find our restoration for your sins and for mine. This is the wonder of the cross. Now let's turn to the last three words of Jesus. And so the fifth word on the cross is a fairly simple uh, word. It's simply three words. John records it in his gospel in John chapter 19 verse 28. Later, knowing that that all was now completed so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. The jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to the lips of Jesus. This is John chapter 19, verses 28 and 29. Some, some think of, of God's love for us as abstract, as theoretical, as conceptual by nature. The fifth word lets us know how very real it is and how much we matter to God. How do we know that? Not only does God say it, but he shows it. He does something for us. At this moment on the cross, Jesus is burning with fever. His lips are parched, they're dehydrated, they're swollen. He can't speak. He's hung out to dry. At that moment, he expresses a physical need. I am thirsty. It's the first time he says anything about himself. I'm, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Dehydrated, parched. The soldiers give him some cheap soldier's wine, some sour vinegar so that he can speak. They wet his lips with the hyssop branch. We go into detail in that in the, in the fifth word in our message series on the seven last words of Jesus. The same hyssop branch that was used on the Passover night in Exodus as the people left Egypt. Now, the reason Jesus wants something on his lips is because he wants to say something else to us, but he can't. So he needs someone to wet his lips. 
what he's going to say to us is 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 so profound that that the metaphor the allegory here is that he will be thirsty so that we will thirst no more by what he says and in saying it we worship a god who understands our need we worship a god who when we suffer he understands and knows what it's like to suffer because he suffered so greatly upon the cross for you and me. Our God's not some distant, detached deity. He's real. And he was not only fully God, he was fully man. And he experienced a suffering beyond that which you or I will ever know in our lives. So that he can, so that he can say to us, I know when you suffer. I know what it's like to suffer. I know what it's like to suffer alone. Now let's turn to the sixth word on the cross. Let's now turn to the sixth word of Jesus. It is a word of victory. Uh, John records that word this way. John 19, verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said three words. It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When Jesus had received the cheap, sour soldier's wine, he said, it's finished. The Father, you have sent me for a task, for an earthly mission, and now I'm going to give you a final status report. It's done. He uses a word that is carefully chosen, to telestai the perfect tense of a completed state. It is achieved, it is accomplished, it is finished, it is over, it is done. It is the end of a payment, mission fulfilled, an action brought to an end. It's over. Now the question becomes, what is the it that is finished? What is the subject of the verb? And clearly he's not referring to the physical torture, the end of torture or of suffering, because he still has one other word to say. He's still suffering. So what is the it that is finished? It is the salvation of his people. It is redemption, it's atonement, it's reconciliation, it's restoration. It's salvation. The Lamb of God has made a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and it is done once and for all. One substitute has paid for the sins of all of those who will turn to him. This final word, uh, sixth word, is, is not a gasp of defeat. It is a declaration of victory on the cross. And then and only then is he ready to say the seventh word, a word of fulfillment. Luke writes in chapter 23, verse 44, it was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. That is, it's now 12 o'clock. Darkness comes over the whole land. We go into great detail about that in the series in the last words of Jesus and the significance of the darkness. And now it's the ninth hour, three o'clock. He's about to die. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. And the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. In the darkness, just before he died, he cried out in a great voice his last word. None of the Gospels record that Jesus simply died. They all say that his soul, his pneuma, his, his spirit, went into the hands of the Father, of his Father. Everything he is, is now his Father's. And then, and only then, did he breathe his last. His muscles relaxed, his head dropped to his chest, and he died so badly beaten, death came so quickly, there was no need to break his legs. 
to fulfill the scriptures. And so these are the seven last words of Jesus. All of this was for you and for me. To pay for our human failure, for our sinfulness. It was filthy. It was beautiful. It was ugly. It was wonderful. It was horrifying. It was amazing grace, friends. Amazing grace. And because of it, one day we can all experience the fullness of the blessing of the benediction of Israel and look into the light of the countenance of God. And now on this Good Friday, we have a choice to make, either to rededicate or make it for the first time in our lives. Either we can experience the horrors of the cross and the penalty of the curse ourselves personally, forever, or we can cast ourselves on the mercy of God like the thief did, the common criminal on the cross. That is the central teaching of the Christian faith. Jesus paid a price that we can't pay. He met a standard we can't meet so that we could be received into the kingdom of God. God rejected his son so that he will not have to reject you and me. Jesus must walk the road to the cross and we must walk the road of faith and trust and receive his grace and his forgiveness. So those are the seven last words of Jesus on the cross. Statements of incomparable importance and significance to you and to me. And I pray that this Good Friday, 2020, a Good Friday that none of us will ever forget, may be a defining moment in each of our lives where we come and we thank God for what he has done for us on the cross in this great passion of Jesus. Let us pray together. Father, this is a holy moment between me and you. I see myself looking into your eyes upon the cross and you looking at me. Stu, I love you. I want to forgive you. I want you to live with me forever. Receive me by faith. Trust in me alone for the riches of paradise. And you will receive them through what I do and what I say here on this cross. Gaze upon me. Embrace me. Cling to me. Rely upon me. Trust me. Just trust me. I do, Father. I trust you through the work of your son, Jesus. And through the revelation of your Holy Spirit. It's the most glorious thing that a human being can do is to trust you. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. I kneel before you this very moment arms outstretched. And I look forward not only to living this day with you, but I look forward to living all of eternity with you. I pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let's close our time with some prayers together. And so it's Good Friday. It's a Good Friday that none of us will ever forget. I hope you have found some comfort and some peace in these words. I want to read two final prayers to you in our prayer book. In the Good Friday service, they're on page 280. 
let me read these prayers. Join with me in praying, please. And, and, and catch the significance of these timeless words for us as they meet us in a present day modern world. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray. That there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence. Carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation, that the whole world see and know the things which were cast down, those things which were cast down are being made new. Those things which have grown old are being raised up and brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made. All this through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And so now let us prepare on this Good Friday to celebrate the raising of God's Son, Jesus Christ, on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. And may you as families be, be preparing for that and celebrating that and looking forward to it. Because I will see you on Easter Sunday morning and we will be talking about some strange events which take place in the graveyard outside the city of Jerusalem. I look forward to seeing you there at that time. God bless you. Amen.
Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble.